It is wonderful to be here, and I'm so glad to be invited. Thank you so much. You know, the writer Anne Lamott told this story in Bird by Bird. When she was young, Lamott kept working on this, this novel, and it wasn't very good. It was about a guy named Arnold or something like that. And, and she kept obsessing over the novel, and she kept working it and reworking it, and she kept sending it to her agent, and her agent would say, uh, no, uh, try again. And her agent would send it back for her to work on it some more, and she would work on it some more. And then her beloved father, who was also a writer, began to die. He was diagnosed with a terminal illness, and as she was grieving this eventual loss, he told her to pick up a pen because now she finally had something to write about. <laughs> and so she did. In her brokenness, she wrote her first novel about a young woman whose beloved father was diagnosed with a brain tumor. She took that pain and she turned it into art and it resonated with her readers. And Lamott has continued to write about those bittersweet moments with humor and with longing. She writes about death. She writes about parenthood. She writes about the cellulite on her legs. <laughs> if you've ever read Lamott, you know what I'm talking about. The last book I read was about a daughter who is in the midst of a drug addiction. It was brutal, and it was beautiful. She's simply able to grasp the broken world, to put it on display until your, your heart, it, it just aches with the words. And meaningful art does that. It sings out in this minor chord until it finds some resonance within us. And we began to feel the same note coming from our gut. Somehow, even if we thought we had absolutely nothing in common with the artist, we hear something that matches the same sorrowful song that we've been trying to sing, but we didn't have the right tune until we heard someone else. And something in our own belly, it begins to sing out too, until we can say, yes, I know that brokenness. I know that pain. And now I know that I'm not alone in it. I know we have a shared humanity. <laughs> I love our passage this morning. It's problematic for me because it talks of God planning evil against Israel, and that's really hard for me to figure out theologically because I believe in a loving God. But I love the passage because God sends the prophet Jeremiah down to the potter's house. And I imagine that prophet entering the house, smelling the earth's clay, inhaling it. The humidity hangs in the air as Jeremiah sees the artist working at the wheel. We can assume that the potter had an ideal shape in mind when he sat down at the wheel. He knew the size the pot had to be and how much clay should be used. He began to mold the vessel and when it wasn't coming out right, maybe the clay was off balance, maybe it didn't have enough water, maybe it just wasn't pliable enough, maybe he began to make the walls of the vessel too thin but somehow it didn't match what the potter had in mind. And so the potter stopped the wheel. He took the clay in his hands and he reworked it. He broke it. He banged it on the counter to make sure that there weren't any air bubbles. He worked out the folds. He worked out the wrinkles. He smoothed it out until he could put the clay back on the wheel and begin the process again. 
He formed it. And then he reformed it until the vessel on the wheel matched the vessel in his mind. It's a metaphor, a beautiful one, that reminds us that our lives are in the hands of God. God surrounds us, God stretches us, God molds us and shapes us. And there is an ideal of us. We live in the mind of God. We live there in the form that our lives are supposed to take. <laughs> it's an amazing thought, isn't it? Jonathan Edwards wrote a lot about this. Meister Eckhart wrote a lot about this. And as Christians, we spend our lives praying, hoping, yearning to be that thing God wants us to be. <laughs> and then something happens. We get all lopsided, off balance, something tears. Some, suddenly we begin to feel ourselves being ripped from the wheel. We feel ourselves being banged on the counter. We are sure that we are broken. <laughs> it's happened to all of us. It happened to Lamotte when she heard that diagnosis about her father. In AA, they talk about it hitting bottom. But we don't need a particular addiction to feel that pain. And stop and think about it for a moment. It happened to you. It happened to me. When did you suffer a loss so terrible? Can you remember it? It is the stuff of everyday life. And somehow, we end up living through it with this amazing resilience that we have. I remember being overwhelmed by the brokenness of our shared humanity. I was 26 years old when God called me to be a pastor. I was serving a rural congregation in an extremely poor part of the country, but it was still a Presbyterian church and looked a lot like most Presbyterian churches. There were doctors, there were lawyers, there were Ivy League professors there in that small community. And I would walk into that place wondering what in the world I had to offer, how all of these wise, intelligent, unbelievable people could have called me. I didn't know why they were even there in that place until I was there for a little while and realized the brokenness the heartache, the bitterness, the frustrations. And I realize that no matter where we are, we have that longing and that brokenness that surrounds us. I began to see the cracks. And it didn't take long because no matter how accomplished, successful, beautiful, rich, everyone has been knocked against that cabinet. We've gone through the pain of being stretched. Sometimes we create with that pain. After all, we were made in the image of God. And so as we create, God creates us. And where is God in all of this? Where is God when we are feeling brokenness, the loss, and the heartache? This is one of the most important questions for us as people of faith, and people have been wrestling with it for thousands of years. It's haunted academic theologians in all of us as thinking Christians. I think the potter's metaphor is important as we remember this and as we ask this. I'm a writer. I've been working on a book now for about 10 years. 
it's gonna come out soon, February. So I, I'm happy, I'm finally seeing the deadline. But I've had at least five editors in this process, and most of them have been brutal. They've taken my words and they've cut them completely unceremoniously. They told me my stories didn't matter, that they were boring, that they were unnecessary. They didn't apologize. Like if you're at a party and somebody comes up to you and says that story was really boring, you would expect an apology after that. But my editors, they did not apologize at all. <laughs> they just kept hitting delete. I used to talk, read about writers who talked about the editing process as killing our darlings. Have you ever heard that before? Hemingway's used it, and Stephen King's used it, killing our darlings. I used to hear that and think, oh my goodness, that is so overdramatic. Come on, they're just syllables. If you cut it, use them somewhere else until I wrote this book. And then I started feeling the pain of my darlings being killed. <sighs> Suddenly, there felt something brutal in the process. It's infuriating to have our darlings killed. It's infuriating to have that clay taken off the wheel and pounded out to start over again. It's heartbreaking when you use the wrong color and the painting, it just feels completely irredeemable. It's horrifying when we play the wrong note and it screeches instead of soars. But the artist, the artist must work through these things because it's a reflection of the creative process, because it's through the brokenness that the beauty happens. It is the work and the labor of making something happen. And as we go back to that important question of where God is in our brokenness, we know that it's the same way with God. We know that as humans, death happens, loss happens, humans do brutal things to one another, and life is painful and life is difficult. Yet throughout all of it, God is lovingly surrounding us. And God is weeping with our loss, trying to take what's left, molding us into something amazing. Most artists do not willingly destroy their works. They love them. They're rooting for them. They're giving them all of their lavish attention, hours and hours. And in the process, when terrible things happen, when that rip happens in the wall of the pottery, when you have to kill the darlings, when you hear that screech, they start over. And so it is with God, with a broken heart, God surrounds us in the process. Art often bleeds with brokenness. Have you been to the Hunter Museum lately? Right now they have a great exhibit. And uh, if you have the day off, Labor Day tomorrow, you can uh, go on over there because hopefully they're open. But there is an artist named Harvey Dunn. And he paints with these strong and determined strokes, making sure that we see the bleakness of the prairie with a mother clutching her child against all the elements. He shows the painful realities of a woman leading an oxen through a field. And we see it and we feel this heartbreak. And he used to, put up gigantic canvases, and he made this canvas so it would, uh, it would go in a circle so that he could get some 
a free canvas, and he would be set up in the middle of battlefields, and he would draw and paint what was going on in the battlefields, and he would be able to bring the labor and the heartache of the soldiers to people. And even as the war was buzzing around him, even as officers were yelling at him to move his paints and move his canvas, he would stand still and he would keep drawing these amazing paintings because it was that important for him to get the sorrow, to get the loss, to get the pain there on the canvas. My friends, life is not easy. And there are many ways that we can respond to the sorrows of our labor. We can pick up the pen. We can feel the texture of the pot. We can mix the paint on our canvas. We can begin to create. And as we work in the image of God, our creator, But no matter how we respond to our own brokenness, let us remember that God is surrounding us. God loves us like an artist yearning for beauty. God is for us and longs for us to be that image in God's mind. And as we move from reading this Bible and trying to figure out these words, wrestling with all that is in here, and as we move to the table, we can remember that in our brokenness, we have a God who is also broken, who wears the scars, who suffers with us, Thanks be to God, our creator, our liberator, and our sustainer. Amen.